disciplines indeed, and uh, it means it's hard work, and it means that you got to keep trying it and doing it and, and getting there. And so thank you for the privilege to try to deal with one that's, that's very important also, and that's uh, right here at Chapel Street. Kenton and I served together at the chapel in Akron, Ohio, and I love your name. You added street as if to say, uh, take it to the street, and that's what you're doing the, the 24th and, and the, when you leave here today also. But my assignment is forgiving others. Anybody near you that you've never forgiven and you know you should, please point to them right now. <laughs> no, don't do it. I see too many marriages falling apart. One of my favorite events from uh, Akron, Ohio, in the chapel was when Kenton and I went fishing. And uh, we're both very, very good at fishing. And I asked him to maybe put the boat in the lake while I got our license renewed. And, and this, is, this is what he did, and we've never fished since, as I recall. <laughs> Not true. In the Bible, you, you have this list of fruits of the Spirit, or fruit of the Spirit, singular. Uh, and the first one, the fruit of the Spirit, is love. And many people think you could stop right there, that that binds all the rest together. That's what this passage, Colossians chapter 3. If you'd like to follow there, there's three verses on confessing, no, receiving, no, on just plain forgiving others. Last week, Jeff did a great job on confessing our sins to God. Now, how about when we take that and show it to others? What will you do? So I'm going to ask you a couple times, is there anybody you need to forgive? Not are they going to ask you, because whether they ask you or not, you got to do it, baby. You got to come to that place. That's what these verses say. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, that's how God thinks of us, holy and beloved, Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. 13 is so clear. Bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. The fruit of the Spirit, all commands, staccato, just listen to a couple of them. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself, do what is right, obey what is honest, obey the house rules of God, stay pure, forgive everyone, return good for evil. We're going to need help. We cannot do this ourselves. And we live what Stetzer from Wheaton called the age of outrage. You know it. Uh, not only in marriage and in homes and all different ways, but in Washington, D.C. People have no idea how to argue or discuss. Republicans and Democrats and everybody else. How do you handle your grievances against others? That's what I ask. That's what this asked me. In chapter 3, verse 1, he gives the background for this producing spiritual fruit. We are called to produce spiritual fruit, verse 12. But the background is, look how God looks at you. If you then have been raised with Christ, verse 1, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died. Whoa. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's you. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. He says, I died. You died. You're a Christian if you are in Christ. You died with Christ, huh? In God's eyes. When Christ died, you died because he saw you united with Christ even way back then. You were raised with Christ. In a sense, he says here, you're already seated in the heavenlies with Christ. Now forgive people. 
That's what he's going to say. If this is true, if this is you, then put on these clothing. He, he spends about seven or eight verses saying what to take off. Don't do this kind of stuff. You don't live like the other people in Colossae did or in Geneva or wherever I'm from, you're from. Then he says in verse 12, put on spiritual fruit. Verse 12. Put on then, think of clothing, think of getting dressed. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. That's how God sees us. If you read your Old Testament really, recently, you know that those are the exact terms God used for Israel. Holy, beloved, chosen ones. God has always wanted people that he could say, well, look at them when they go, well, did you see what he did there in Chicago? Did you see what he did over there? God always has wanted to say, well, look at Israel. They were to be a, a showcase. I don't mean that in a, in a Hollywood way. They were, God wanted to say, if you want to see how I mean people to live, watch Israel. You want to see how to treat a wife? Look at the married people of Israel. And now he says, Chapel Street, watch these people. As holy, beloved of God, he loves me, he loves you, and chosen by God, that's the background before he tells us how we should live. Is that you? The basics of where it starts are right in front of us every week. It starts at the cross. On that cross, Jesus Christ took all the dirty laundry anybody has ever committed, verses 4 through 11. Everything Israel did, everything I did, everything I do tomorrow that's wrong, and he took it on his spirit, on his back, and he cried out, My God, why have you forsaken me? He also cried out, It is finished, which means it is paid for. When you believe in Christ, you don't just say, okay, I believe, demons do that. Yeah, that's true, he died, he rose again, I was there. No, you say, I believe in him, my Lord, my Savior, I trust him. That takes your judgment away because he did it for you. More than that, you don't go to heaven with a zero, he plants his righteousness on top of your name in heaven. Romans 4.1 says, our faith is counted as righteousness. Whoa. Is that you? That the righteousness of Jesus Christ is credited to your account. Now we're to live in combination with Christ. The judgment totally taken. Don't ever say, I guess I'm paying for my sins. Nonsense. And your righteousness is a gift. Now live as if that's true and live in combination. So he says, as God's chosen ones, as God's beloved, raised with Christ. Whoa. If you're not sure of that, come there today. To believe in the Lord isn't to say, yes, Abraham Lincoln lived, Jesus lived. No, it's, it's to rest in him this way and live that way. So as God's chosen ones. Last week, Jeff, I think it, it was right here, asked you to raise your hand if you think when God sees you, he says, but. Yeah, I know him, but. And he said a lot of you raise your hand. I, I understand that. I would too, except when I see it this way. This is the way he sees us. And now our responsibility for that is right here in, again, verse 12. Put on, then, like, like clothing, like a shirt, a dress, kindness, or first compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Now, just to mention, you don't have to read Greek to know what those words mean. Compassion feel with other people. You got to know how other people feel. You got to wait for an answer if you say, how are you? And you got to care how they feel. That's what he says, to feel with other people. Second word is kindness. Uh, kindness is a lost attribute for many people. It just means to be nice. Hello, be nice. 
If you're in Christ, he was nice to lepers. He was nice to sinners. He sat down with people worse and, and just as bad as all of us. And he loved them. Humility. It's not about me. It's not about you. You know anybody that washed feet? You know anybody who put others first? That's who we follow, our Lord. Humility. Meekness. In, in, especially in that culture. And today, I think, meekness is not really an attribute of leaders. And the Greeks frowned on anybody who wasn't big deal. Meekness. Moses was the meekest man on earth, God said. You can still be a leader and be meek and do it for the good of the people. We're, this is the kind of thing we're to put on patience. How do you learn patience? You stand in line. You get married. <laughs> yeah, you learn patience by learning to live with each other. With This is all about relationships. Now, there's virtue in the Bible about creativity and industry and working hard. Yeah, but, but the first ways that this shows when you trust Christ and see yourself in Christ are how you relate to other people. You know that. I know that. So our combination life means I don't say, I got to forgive this guy at school or kids at junior high. That's tough at times. I remember what I was like at junior high. I would have been hard to forgive. Please don't say amen. <laughs> but because of who we are in Christ and because we can live the combination life, is that you or are you on your own? If you live in Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the, the way to live in this life is God's Spirit, Christ in us. And now we bear fruit. Your neighbors have a fruit tree. There's fruit. Why don't I? Why, why do some have flowers in their front yard? Why don't you? It's because they planted them and they work combination. God grows flowers. God goes, grows fruit. Yes. But we work in combination. Now, that's the background, obviously, for verse 13. And I'm going to keep saying to myself, this only happens as I'm in Christ, as I come to the cross, because everybody in the room, starting with me, needs forgiveness for not forgiving others. And now in 13, he launches right into that. Look at it. Bearing with one another. Here's one of the one another's in the Bible. There's a lot of them. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. Do you do that? Look how he defines it. Look what it says. What does this look like? It, bearing with one another. It's interesting. I believe in inspiration of the Bible. I know this church does. These are words chosen very carefully, guided by God's Spirit. Paul writes, you bear with each other, not you change each other. That's, that's preferable to everyone in the room. No, you bear with each other, meaning you help each other, carry their burden. You, you put up with each other. We should, uh, some of you are married. You know who you are. You should by now. You bear with each other. You don't, yeah, you can say things and try to help each other grow, but sometimes you just bear with each other. And that's the way a church operates. I coach churches now, and there's a lot of churches that love fights. There's boards that love fights. There's pastors, too, but it's usually not their fault. <laughs> no. It, you bear with each other. I know there's times you, things have to be corrected, but often you know what it means in your life. You bear, you, you bear with each other. I remember an old story, a guy that doctor told him, you have rabies, serious rabies. And he said, I need to give you some instructions if you're going to remain alive. And the guy was writing things down, and the doctor kept going and giving him, telling him exactly what he had to do. He said, I'm glad you're writing these down. 
He said, no, I'm writing down people I want to bite. <laughs> he was a Baptist before you changed the name to Chapel Street. <laughs> All of us know it's hard to forgive people, and he launches right into it. Bear with each other, not change each other. Put up with each other. These are unpleasant traits you see in other people. Give these verses to the leaders in Washington, D.C., in the House and the Congress and the White House, and they'd say it doesn't apply. Some Christians say that. Bear with each other. And the second part of verse 13, also about forgiveness, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. Whoa. Put up with each other. Now, if you're a parent, this is not about police work or parent work. There are times to correct. This is about personal relationships. Put up with each other and bear with each other, help each other. And if you have a complaint against the other, it doesn't say when he asks you, you forgive him. It says forgive each other. Whoa. Will you keep doing that? It's the way to be married. It's the way to be single. It's the way to be a teenager. It's hard to learn because the ego in my head always says, I know you're right. But Paul is talking to Christians about how to grow. There's times to confront. There's times to discipline. There's times to arrest. This issue is about human relationships right here in your home and wherever we are. Uh, when we had, a, we had a reconciliation ministry at the chapel, uh, labor management, it even was officially that way in town, but also every pastor has sat down with couples, and I always read these verses when I started those sessions, nervous as could be. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. That's pretty strong. Just as Christ, uh, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Any questions? Get rid of certain things. Throw that dirty laundry away. Come on. Why? Because you're in Christ, just as dearly loved children, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Friends, that's how I'm to live. That's how you're to live. Anybody you should forgive. It doesn't say when they ask, it just says do it. I didn't deserve any forgiveness I got from God. When I was first forgiven, God didn't say, well, looks like we have a no-risk offender here, somebody I can trust for all his life. No, he forgave me. When I confessed my sins yesterday, God didn't say, well, this is because you're going to preach at Chapel Street. I'll forgive you. It's always out of grace and mercy, not even because we deserve it at all. Do you believe that? Do you rest in that? You do if you confess your sins. Catholics and Lutherans are good at that. We should be every day. But he always forgives us. We're in Chicago Bears territory, and I, I love to remember the story of Mike Singletary. Do you remember him? A great linebacker for our favorite Chicago Bears. I don't think you can go to this church if you root for Green Bay. Mike Singletary, they used to show his eyes from the end zone camera and he'd, he'd stare at the quarterback like this. If I were the other quarterback, I'd say, Mike, look away. Don't. One time he was interviewed by Jim Nance at the end of a, a, a hard game, and Jim Nance, I'll never forget it, the interviewer said, sometimes you get clobbered and, and blocked by two guys over here and you still make the tackle over there. How do you do that? And he said, I get up. That's it. I get up. 
What do you do if you have not, con not forgiven someone in your marriage or in your family? Or in Will you get up? Come on, from now on. Paul's saying this, this is what we should do. It's very clear, forgive. And the next part of the verse says why, and it's the same theme carried on. Verse 13, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Why? It's what God is all about. In the Pentateuch, when God dares to show Moses what it's like, uh, Moses hides in the cleft of the rock. He hideth my soul. We heard the song. And God comes by, but he also says, I am compassionate slow to anger, his first words describing himself, a God of love. Yes, he must judge, of course. But he first wants to forgive us all. And so God's whole movement in Israel and in Christianity and for all of us right here is that we would be people that do it differently, who know how to love, who, who show forgiveness no matter what. If you, you bear with someone who's tough to bear with and you forgive them, is that the way you're made? It's not the way we were born. Jesus told a parable once, and I'll just say it to you. It's Matthew chapter 18, and there was a man who owed Let's say, I mean, everybody guesses at the exact amount, but every commentator puts it in the billions. Hello, billions. And he owed that to his king. He was greatly in debt. And the king, by this man's begging, actually, forgave him totally of the billions of dollars. This man had someone who owed him a slight fraction of that and he would not forgive him. And Jesus told the parable to say, you guys, look what God has done for you to forgive you. Now forgive each other. Will you do that? At the end of it, uh, he threw the king, heard about this, threw the guy in jail. There was punishment. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart any questions. Whoa! The point is, as God has forgiven you of how many sins, sometimes in the selfishness of our lives, every breath almost is a sin. It's just God forgives us over and over again, and he makes this absurd parable, this billions of dollars with $200. God has forgiven us of all our sins. When he enters us, help, brings us into heaven, will come combined with Christ, covered by his righteousness. He loves me. He loves you. Now he says, will you show that love? Let me stop here and just say something pretty personal, but also maybe personal to you. If you're thinking, you know, some of this doesn't describe me. There's three guys I'd like to punch in the mouth if that were the, my style, or at least just hold these grudges against, or three people. Don't start saying, am I a Christian or aren't I? Our assurance is not based upon one command. It's based upon who Christ is and what he did. But make a quick move, starting right now, to become a person of love and forgiveness and putting up with and bearing and forgiving others, please. Run to the cross where Christ forgave you of all your sins. That's what he wants in our lives. A favorite conversation all of us, I think, probably have is John 21. Peter comes over from the lake, and I think it's a private conversation. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Yes, you know I love you. Three times, Peter, do you love me? 
Why? I think every Bible scholar says three denials. He wants to show, I love you. I will forgive you. And if we could have a conversation with Jesus right now, he'd probably say to all of us, do you love me? He'd tell us to love his sheep, feed his sheep, but he'd also want to forgive us for every sin he has in Christ. Are you with him on this? Verse 14, I think, adds to it. He just says, I'll tell you what holds this all together. Verse 14, and above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Above all these, what's the highest virtue you can have in life? Well, there's no question if you read the Bible. 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest of all these is love. It binds, it's the highest and it binds everything together. A binder on a sewing thing holds other parts together, binding and food holds the ingredients together. This holds a church together. You bear with it. You love each other. Some of us are very good at business. That's nothing compared to being good at love. Some of you got all A's and still do. The highest grade is love. Some of you are terrific athletes. Maybe you bat 333. The greatest that God sees in a life is a life of love. Some of us know church and how to do it. Nothing compared to loving people in the name of Christ. He says it's the highest thing you can do, and it binds everything together. Will you keep doing that? One time I was running in a 10K race, never ran fast, but always did because we had multiple services. And a guy, I wasn't doing very well, and he just kept saying to me, he ran beside me, lean over, we were going up a hill, take shorter steps. And that's what he would say to every one of us. Don't be a big deal, lean over, forgive. It's a discipline of grace because of what God has first done to us. Take shorter steps, just do what's right. Will you keep doing that? Will you start doing that if you haven't? Because it's all, follow the way of love. It says at the end of 1 Corinthians, pursue love, because it won't come to you. It won't be natural. Run after it and forgive. Some of you are old enough to remember the name of Lee Atwater. He was uh, chief of the Republican Party and was mean. Uh, Time Magazine Cut, did a cover story called him The Demon in Washington. He was, he was mean. George H.W. Bush did a very mean campaign against Dukakis. I'm pointing to Boston. And everybody thought, that's not George H.W. Bush, but it was, Duk it was Lee Atwater. But Lee Atwater developed a brain tumor. And he said, as he wrote about this, the fifth person who said, call Doug Coe, Doug Coe is a gentle man behind the scenes, just died. Christianity Today said, wrote a beautiful piece about him a few years ago. But Doug Coe was behind the scenes in Bible studies all over Washington for years. He helped us start a prayer breakfast in Ashland and in Akron. He met with Lee Atwater, and the third time they met, Atwater gave his life to Christ. But the tumor kept growing. He's a vicious lion demon in Washington, but his life has changed. As was his custom, Doug Coe helped disciple him, and he grew. But his last public appearance was at the presidential prayer breakfast a number of years ago. A good friend of mine and ours, Ron, was there, and he said, after the speaker, they wheeled Lee Atwater in, had everybody sit down. Everybody from Washington knew this guy, and the people from all over the country said, Lee Atwater would like to say a few words. From his wheelchair, he would die three weeks later. He said two things. There are only two questions in life. Do you love Jesus Christ? 
does it make a difference in your life? And they wheeled him off. And the questions still stand. Do you love Jesus Christ? Does it make a difference in the way you love others? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the love and generous grace of Jesus Christ, your Son, who took on his back, his spirit, all the sins of the world, died for all of us. Help us bear with each other and accept this clear challenge from your word to forgive each other. As you pray, if you're totally forgiven by God, just thank him, not out loud. If you're not there yet, just ask him, I would like to come there. Is this true? Help me put my life in trust in Jesus Christ and follow him. Or as you pray, if a name jumps out, or ten names, won't you forgive them in the name of Christ? Lord, we ask your help to be more and more combination lives in Jesus, our Savior. And we pray in his name. Amen.